In this series, we explore the hidden world of Manchester's Orthodox Jewish community, who live by ancient laws. Laws which affect every aspect of an Orthodox Jew's life, including what they eat. It says explicitly in the Torah, in the Bible, it says explicitly that a Jewish person shouldn't eat blood, shouldn't eat the blood of an animal. Everything has to be kosher, and that includes the method of slaughter. The blade has to be 100% smooth. And besides the smoothness, it has to be razor sharp. If it's not razor sharp, then you, you're not doing what's required. There are 160,000 Orthodox Jews in Britain. 30,000 of these live in Manchester. They shop, go to school and run businesses just like everyone else in the country. But unlike everyone else, in some ways they could be living thousands of years ago. For every detail of their daily lives is governed by ancient biblical texts. The, within here it actually tells us how one should get what you do when you get up in the morning, how one gets dressed, how one acts. Um, before praying in the morning, we don't eat. You know, you've got to pray for your blood before you, before you eat anything, you know, in case we take a drink, etc. How you can greet somebody in the morning, what you can say before you pray, what you can't say, um, how you get to synagogue, what you do in the synagogue, what happens if you turn up a little late for prayers, which part do you miss out, etc. All these things are all there. <laughs> Rabbi Kay is one of a team of rabbis working in the heart of the community at the Manchester Beth Din. It's the organization that all Jews in the city look to for guidance on every aspect of Jewish law. Name Beth Din means a house of law. It's all amazing because, you see, the ancient law may start with the ox damaging another ox in a primitive society. But that can be, that is interpreted into a car damaging another car or, or, or even a more modern sort of, of electronically damaging somebody's computer, uh, sending in a virus and damaging his data, etc. So the principles are all there. The cow has changed into a car and has changed into a computer and the, and the offending cow has now changed into an electronic virus. But the principles are all there. Right, you want to, you've just bought this, have you? Yes. And one of the things which we do with the very vessels that we uh, use to make our food, whether it's our pots, our pans, our cutlery, we immerse them in a body of water. Water is considered a sign of purity. Mm -hmm. But yes, they should be taken to the uh, mikvah, and uh, it should be dipped. Okay. And I hope you have many, many Good cups of tea. sacred cups of tea from it. <laughs> Having sanctified it, I'm Thank sure the tea will taste better. In the Anglo-Saxon world, Religion is more a concept, but is rarely translated in day-to-day -day activities, very rarely. At most, probably, a Sunday visit to the church, etc. Whereas Judaism, in common with possibly some other Middle Eastern religions, is a very intense religion. So there may well be, there not may well be, there is, obviously, a philosophy behind it. But that philosophy is translated into day day-to-day, -day, daily activities. This section deals, well, there'll be, within here, there's quite a lot that deals with kosher dietary laws. I mean, we're talking about, and that's only, that's the, the what's called in Hebrew, the shulchan oruch, the prepared table of all the laws. But, you know, there's many, many discussions and many uh, books have been written on kosher dietary laws. These laws are enforced by around 30 full-time kosher inspectors employed by the Beth Din. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Is the boss in? Yes, through there. Lovely, thanks very much. Hello. Everything in this bakery will have come from an, a source which has been approved, produced under supervision, I come in here, well, very irregularly. I might come in twice in a week and I might come in once in a month. Generally, they don't know that I'm coming. They wouldn't know that I'm coming in France, generally. 
here you have a sign saying that these items are parallel. This means that there's no milk content in these items in this display at all. And the reason for this is because since we don't eat milk and meat mixed together, your customers would be interested to know that this that can be eaten with a meat meal as opposed to items in this fridge which are dairy and people will take them home and know not to eat them with a meat product because there is milk in them. Put this way, I mean, if, if there was a piece of meat in one of my ovens that's it, until I contact the rabbi and find out how we could possibly make, make the oven kosher again, i.e. by burning it out or something like that. And that's it, I wouldn't bake anything else in it. I wouldn't dare to, no way. Not only do you have to watch what you're doing, keeping kosher costs more. I get spilled off the best in once a month. Um, you know, one of those things, kosher food is more expensive and that's one of the reasons. Not all the employees have to be Jewish. The best Jewish law is the Saturday, doing nothing on a Saturday. Not allowed to do nothing on a Saturday. Should be everybody's law. Right? <laughs> There's that many festivals through the year. You've got Cheese Festival, Amantash, Jewish New Year. You've got so many festivals. We're in the Guinness Book of Records. 1,001 knots in there. I think it was, how many was it? 2,001 was it? 2001 in 37 minutes knots, but uh, you roll them out like that and knots them like that. So here the in-house supervisor is washing and preparing strawberries for kosher use. Strawberries are normally infested with insects and thrips and the like. Well, these are forbidden by Jewish law. We mustn't consume any insects at all, and vegetables and all other many other different types of uh, uh, products regularly have infestation. Strawberries is one of the problematic items. You know, you'd look at these strawberries when they're in the, the ponnet and you wouldn't think that there could be anything on them. You, you absolutely, they look perfectly clean and beautiful red and when you put them in the water and you soak them for a while and with the solution and afterwards you, you drain them out, you find little thrips, little live insects floating in the water. Well, it says explicitly in, in the Torah that uh, we are not allowed to eat a, a whole insect. But the fact of the matter is, is the insect is, is, is interesting. If the insect is not whole, we're allowed to eat it. And it's a very, uh, it's a very really? complex. Right? If it's not whole. If, it's not if whole. it's been dissected, it would be all right. But because, because we, have, we have a tradition that is given down to us from Mount Sinai. You know, that, that when, when God gave Moses the, the written Torah, he also gave him an oral explanation of all of the tiniest, tiny details. And that is, that is, we have that today in the form of our Talmud. And that tells us exactly how to understand the, uh, the written Torah. And these details are contained in, the, in that oral Torah. So that, there's no it, question about it. it. It actually says that portions of the insect or sections of the insect are fine, but not the whole insect. Yeah, well, it's not that it's fine, but obviously it's allowed. But at the, same at the same time, we mustn't go and dissect an insect purposely for the purpose of consuming it. So we can, you can't use it as a loophole. Um, have it, if it's already been done, then it's all right. But you can't go ahead and do it and use it as a loophole. Aha, uh -huh, how are you? The Manchester Beth Din is one of the top kosher authorities in the world. Oh, do you enjoy yourself? Its inspectors are responsible for giving companies a kosher seal of approval here and abroad. For the companies involved, getting a kosher certificate could have a crucial effect on their business. That's right, yeah, because that's why he's, he's getting desperate and obviously he's chasing me and sometimes it can be that it's a, it's a client of mine here who wants some particular product from South America and this kosher certification he has is either not acceptable or it, it, the company does not have a kosher certification. The easiest way is for me to go along and have a quick look. So that's what I do. Or it could be that the company, they themselves are based in the UK they are the traders and they're the ones that want the kosher and the company's based in Brazil or something like that. So they'll arrange the kosher and it suits them to send me at whatever cost it is. There's a, it's a rarity that people have been sort of, you catch somebody out and say to somebody, ah, you've done it specifically. But if it does happen, basically they lose a kosher certification like that. You've got 20 containers on the high seas? Nothing I can do about it. <laughs> The 
Jewish kosher laws have to be policed by a team of kosher inspectors. Rabbi Kay from the Manchester Beth Din has driven 300 miles from Manchester to Aberdeen, his first stop on a tour of Scotland's fish factories. It's a non-kosher hotel, so he has to come prepared. I've got a little bit of cakes, which my wife said take them. Got a little bit of nash. I've got these meals on the go. Have you seen these things? Stick some hot water in here. After three, four minutes, it's a nice mashed potatoes and pot noodle. Well, it's not a pot noodle actually. I don't actually like the pot noodles as much, but it's basically it's it's um I guess it's um freeze dried potato or dried potato in a mash with some mushrooms, and you put the pot water, rehydrates it, cooks it up, and it's actually quite nice. And I found, stick some of these in there, and it's actually a quite nice, quite nice setup. If the number of the little vata, the number of the little vata. Rabbi Kay is making contact with a rabbi from London who's flying up in the morning. Yeah, 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 it's a long, long way. He has a problem. His flight time may clash with his obligation to pray. I have a clue. OK, well, I'll tell you what, give me a call in about, um, in about five minutes, I'll turn the computer on and I'll find out for you. This guy's flying to one one at five two seven, I think, out of out of London Heathrow, which means he's got to leave home five five thirty. Now he ain't going to get a chance to pray, and he can't pray in London at five to seven either. I mean, obviously, he could, half past six is no good; it's too late. So he's got to pray at you know six o'clock, because he's got to be able to get on the plane. And um, we went to pray pray within the first four hours of the morning. Okay, and it's not four hours as in sixty minutes an hour. The day. When it comes to the Jewish day, um, setting the hours, especially for praying, and that we split the daylight hours either from dawn to dawn to nightfall or or sunrise to sunset. All I have to look up here on here is I've got what's called Hebrew calendar, which will come up on the screen in a second, and it will sh I will be able to tap in Aberdeen, I think. I'm not sure if I ever lo loaded Aberdeen, but let's just see here. Aberdeen. No, it didn't like Aberdeen. That's right. Okay. 6.33, he can pray. Hello. Right, yeah, I can't find Aberdeen, but I can find Edinburgh. Edinburgh is showing me 6.33, so 7 o'clock, the hard day is just kind of down. You can definitely um, put on to him. That lot. That, that's the, 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 the Mashiach. I can't... The, the exact, exact, exact nets I won't be able to find because I, I, can't get, I haven't got... Aberdeen. It's 5 a.m. on a farm outside Manchester, and the Beth Din inspector, Rabbi Klarberg, is already at work. Right, thank you very much. I'm not sure one's bigger than the other. Kosher animals have to have split hooves and chew the cud, and only they can produce kosher milk. If you're Jewish in Manchester, the chances are you'll be drinking kosher milk from this farm. But they produce non-kosher milk too, so the Beth Din employs a supervising rabbi to watch over the kosher side. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Hello, Nice to see you again. Everything all right? Yes, I am. Lovely. So what time oh, are we starting? Oh, pardon? What time are we starting? Oh, we're ready for starting right away. Lovely, very good. When we're here in the evening, the milk is left in the tank to chill up overnight. So the tank will be entirely sealed by us. Then when I arrive in the morning, I will, un I will check that the seals are still intact. And then I will then send the milk into the, the processing plant. So this morning's milking will fit into the tank. So I have to make sure when I arrive that the seals are intact as I left them the night before. Be here quite a lot during the milking to ensure that there are no other animals in the herd other than the cows. But certainly the other uh, other animals doing around, such as a buffalo. Right. Or I mean, obviously, obviously a non any non-close animal. I mean, we do know that there are no other animals in the herd. It's very unusual to have a mixed herd, but anyhow. But all the same, the requirements are that we are here to check to ensure, and that is what makes the milk closer. The very fact that we're here checking, although there is no real difference in the milk.
it's been proven that you get 15% more milk out of the cow if there's music. And, and it's finding the right level of music for the cows. If it's too loud, they won't come in the bar. If it's too soft, they won't come in. It's just the right level. And it takes an age to find that level. Uh, any particular tunes? Uh, they have the local radio station and they seem to like it. Uh, well, I do, but there you go. You have to be uh, more careful with antibiotics uh, and cleanliness. Hence, while we wash up each cow. When you, you, when the clusters get dirty, that's when you wash them normally. Here, after every cow, you wash the clusters down. The whole cleanliness is everything here. Uh, that's everything different, really. What? 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 That's all this cow to help. It's 7 a.m. in Aberdeen, and Rabbi Kay is having his first cup of tea of the day in his hotel. He's brought his own supply of kosher milk. Before he picks up the visiting rabbi from the airport, he has to fulfill his first obligation under Jewish law, to say prayers at least three times a day. 708, we should be um, well, well up in the sky. Yeah. And sometimes I have to pray in corners of airports, trains, train stations, you know, on buses sometimes it's happened. As long as people realise this is a hotel room, that's why there's a TV here. There wouldn't be one in my house, and there wouldn't be one in the synagogue either. But it's just good to have a toilet, obviously I can't get rid of it. I would be very pleased if they came here and found that stuck it underneath the toilet, isn't it? Okay, so you'll come on in. No! Can't come on in, Tim. I'm not checked out, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm coming around now. If you come outside the airport, you'll see I'll be, I'll be outside in two minutes. Say that, Cobra. Yeah. Now, when they made the, the Chanukah Sabayas just now, yeah, yeah. the roof spoke. They smelled it. For some reason, Machikadas is not growing. The visitor, Rabbi Lebrecht, belongs to an ultra orthodox kosher organization in London. He wants to check out the Aberdeen Fish Factory to see whether the fish products meet their very particular kosher requirements. Hello! Do you remember Rabbi Greenhouse? I knew of him. He, he phoned me once or twice. Right. Well, this this is one of his. I mean, assistant. His assistant. His assistant. Because you still still supply Mr. Hoffman with some fish pieces. Yes. Right. Well, there you go. So I had a lot of problems with Mr. Hoffman with his fish pieces. I once fell only once in a factory. Is it getting ready for smoking? Getting getting it ready. There you are. You can tell I had it because it's got a line down the middle and there's a thumb lock. It looks like somebody's put a thumb on the fish as it was born. According to Jewish law, for fish to be kosher, they must have fins and scales. What, what is it? What, is this whiting? It's all small habit. Small, small fish cost more money. But this cost more money than the big fish? Really? Yeah. No, 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 because there's more, 
when you buy it, when you start buying, you buy sometimes a small packet. Yeah, it costs you more than a big packet for rata, yeah? Every added ingredient has to be kosher. Even the yellow colouring comes from a source that's been approved. And the lemon colour and the lemon colour from pointings. It's just a powder colour, it's a bag. Just the powder one, the other one's a powder, mm -hmm. just this one's in a cream. Yeah. These are haddocks? Just coli. 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 Is that all pepper and dal? Yeah. It's cracked pepper granule from Global Foods or Gowert. Garlic and herb is coming from other from other from Global Foods or from Gowert's. More it's been checked out. The fish are seasoned with pepper, garlic and herbs. It all has to be kosher, and they have to make sure there's no chance of any non-kosher ingredients getting in by accident. It smells good, though, anyway. The final stage, the boxed fish with the Beth Din stamp of approval, ready for a hundred Sabbath suppers. Let's have a look at the chill. If you live in a fish town where you get on the market, then, then you don't think it's so cheap. Okay. Right, OK. Hey, thanks very much. Well. Nice to meet you again. Well. Right. Look after your dad. I will. Right, OK. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. We're going to have to reverse out. Rabbi Lebrecht is now heading back to London. But for Rabbi Kay, there's more haddock ahead. Back in Manchester, Rabbi First from the Beth Din has to supervise several Jewish bakeries. He has to make sure his ingredients are kosher too. Even the eggs have to get his approval. Again, it varies, but uh, anywhere from 100 to four or 500. That's why you see I'd, I've gotten into the uh, habit of doing them quite quickly. I use a, um, I use a, clear, a clear glass cup, and I, I've got a mirror here. So when I, after I crack it, I pass it over the mirror so I can see the bottom. There might be a blood spot on the bottom of the, of the yolk. And then I dump it into my buckets. Um, what, what are you looking for? Why do you need to see the bottom? Well, I'm looking for blood spots. Now, it's a whole, uh, it's actually a very, very complicated uh, question in halacha here because uh, it basically, it says explicitly in the Torah in the Bible, it says explicitly that a Jewish person shouldn't eat blood, shouldn't eat the blood of an animal. Now, the blood that's in an egg, it's a whole question uh, about what kind of blood that is, and if it's a kind of blood we need to be worried about or not. The fact of the matter is, is that most, of its, most, um, most uh, chickens today, most eggs today are coming from what's called battery hens, and the hens are not actually fertile. So the blood, generally, that we find in these eggs is not really the kind of blood that we're so worried about. Nevertheless, we're still careful to, uh, to get rid of it if we, uh, if we see it. Up in Scotland, Rabbi Kay's kosher tour continues and it's still a long drive ahead before his next stop. There's a whiff of salmon in the air this morning on the west coast of Scotland, as kosher inspector Rabbi Kay leaves his hotel. It's cold this morning, it's the temperature. But he needs to make sure everything's kosher before he can give it the Manchester Beth Din seal of approval. We're going to get sorting later, aren't we? Ah, right. Yeah. I'm looking for a job. Real work. <laughs> oh, now you're being cheeky. <laughs> real work. In the same room as the salmon, they're processing shellfish. But Orthodox Jews don't eat shellfish. They're not kosher so they shouldn't mix. Is this table after used for salmon or...? Just used for this. That's right. it. Nothing else goes onto right. this. No salmon is... Are these queen ones or king ones? These are king. If you're Orthodox Jewish in Manchester, you buy your kosher food from just a few specialist shops. 
regularly policed by the Beth Din's kosher inspectors. It's not only food that they're concerned with, you have to be careful about what you drink as well, particularly when it comes to wine. All wines and grape juices must be kosher supervised from the very, very beginning of the production till the very end. So this is to do with intermarriage, um, socializing with non-Jewish people. I think the preservation of the Jewish people as an independent people, the way it's been, the way it continues to be throughout the generations, has, de has depended on, in part, the fact that we socialize amongst ourselves. And for that reason, there's a prohibition on drinking wines uh, made not by Jewish people. And for that reason, all the kosher wines that you find over here are supervised from the beginning to end, made by Jewish people. In the olden days, that was only social drink, uh, no whiskey or no beer or anything else. And it was felt that by way of preserving, if you like, our identity, one would put some obstacles and difficulties in, in uh, the consumption of wine so as to ensure that it's not uh, used improperly and, 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 uh, and out of hand, so to speak. Because of its importance as a um, mind-affecting uh, drug, if you like, that was the one that was there. And it had some connotations of idol worshipping as well, hence the very restrictive laws were applied to the production of wine. But as I say, it goes back in the very long past where idol worshipping was quite prevalent, and people, as soon as they came across a bit of wine, they tried to somehow uh, turn it into an act of worship, and in order to keep away from that, that regulation was imposed. Some said, since we've got no idol worshippers in our countries anymore, you either got Christians or Muslims, maybe those regulations should no longer apply. But it is clearly stated, clearly debated, and that is the last rule. It's no, in no way can that enactment, although the reason behind it has fallen away, can it be set aside. Every Jewish person has an obligation to become learned. We all have an obligation to be involved in learning Torah. There's no such thing as someone who's, you know, he's just involved in business and, and he's not involved in learning. Everyone has an obligation to learn. We spend a lot of time figuring out and thinking, you know, well, what if? What if this happened? What if that happened? I know I have a lot of arguments with, uh, I've had a you know, number of kind of discussions with the bakers, arguments over um, when they're baking cheese danish. Now they bake cheese danish, they make a little, a little danish, and they put a dollop of cheese in the middle. And uh, sometimes the, the cheese will overflow the edges of it. Now, if that danish happened to be at the end of the, uh, the, end of the sheet, and the cheese uh, spread out and it went over the edge of the tray, it would go, it would fall into the floor of the oven. And then it would make, uh, it would give the oven a, a dairy quality. And if they then put a loaf of bread into that oven right away, so that loaf of bread would have a dairy quality, right? So I have gone to great lengths to convince the bakers to bake their cheese danish in trays that have edges on all four sides. So that they won't have this possibility of what if the cheese, uh, cheese goes over the edge, right? So in the same way, we, 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 we apply this kind of thinking to everything we do. What if this could happen? What if that could happen? We're, we're afraid. We are afraid of the spiritual damage that might come to ourselves, so we make that effort. There are, well, in fact, I'll give you in fact, um, there are, in reality, we shouldn't listen to music at all. Since the, uh, since the destruction of the Second Temple, we shouldn't be listening to music at all except at, at weddings. And of course, our happiness can't be complete until um, the, the temple is rebuilt. So it's music that brings you to dancing, actually. And um, therefore, some say slow music, classical music is okay. Um, most don't bother with that either. But this tape that's on at the moment, although it sounds very musical, actually has got no music at all. It's totally vocal. And therefore, in reality, this could be okay, although it actually makes a mockery of the whole thing, because um, obviously it sounds like music. But, um, you know, obviously, again, conflicting opinions whether you can or you can't. It is written on the tape that it is permitted to be listened to during those times, and um, people do. But I listen to it now because it just sounds a nice tape. And, um, one second, I'm just going to overtake. Now, this is not a spectacular one, but it's, a, it's an overtaking. 
bit of fancy sticking behind the juggernaut for um, a long drive along these roads. So when you get the chance, you overtake. Right. Um, and getting back to even religious things, then, you must do things which would um, impair the, our safety or our health. You've got to be kosher in everything you do. The word actually means correct. That's how my boss um, um, explains it. So you've got to do everything in the correct way. Absolutely everything. This is a medical screening questionnaire to write down, do I have any brains? Do I not have any brains? Are you at present suffering from skin trouble affecting hands, arms or face? No. Boils, dyes or septic fingers? No. Discharge from ear, gums or mouth? No. Do you suffer from recurrent skin or ear trouble? No. A recurrent gastrointestinal disorder? It's a clean bill of health for him. Now what about the salmon? Lunchtime. The salmon's passed the K kosher test with flying colours. Now he's going to have some for lunch. Shall set it up nicely. Right, let's find a nice piece in here. All the food we eat has a spiritual effect on us. So it affects a person's soul. So if a person eats food that has been made, uh, has been made in a way that meets the stringent standards of kosher supervision, it has a positive spiritual effect on his soul. And God forbid if he eats things that have been made uh, that, that violate uh, strict kosher laws, then it can have a negative effect on the soul, God forbid. Ultimately, we understand that uh, in the world to come, you know, we're going to have to deal with this scorecard that we've developed over our life. And, um, and those things, that, the, 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 punish, the, the, the mistakes that we made, so we get some kind of punishment for them. However, if we punish ourselves, if we kind of fix up the mistake we made in this world, then... Uh, then uh, we don't have that. Uh, we don't have to deal with it in the world to come. We can deal with it in this world, which is far better. We deal with it in this world. To, to, to go to decide whether or not we want to do twenty percent or ten percent. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Just um, this is the, see. This is a delivery of uh, of cheese, and this fellow is delivering um, a processed egg product. Which I'll point out when we go in, um, which saves me a lot of cracking. This is our uh, pile here of, uh, of pieces of dough. This is a piece of every dough that's been made in the past 36 hours or so. So I'm going to make a special blessing on the bits for the commandment to separate hala from the dough. And then I'm going to separate some from each of these pieces. Now that I've, I, so now that I made the blessing on this, I've designated this as hala, right? So now it has a special level of uh, of holiness. It's considered to be holy, and I have to dispose of it in a respectful way. I can't just toss it in the trash. Again, if we had a, a temple, this dough would go for the priests. Yeah. Obviously, it would be done. It would be done in a much more sophisticated manner if we had a temple, but fortunately, we don't. So what we do is we double bag it, and then we put it in the trash. The, 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 the fact that we've double bagged it makes it that's considered to be a respectful way of disposing of it. Well, we, we can't eat it. It has to be disposed of. We're not allowed to eat it because we're not in a state of spiritual purity. The way it works is every dough 
needs to have Chala taken from it and given to the priests, right? Until that happens, the bread is not really proper to be eaten. Once I take the, the, that part of the dough out I, and designate it as being holy, so now the rest of the bread is considered to be normal, not holy. What makes this kosher food spiritually beneficial for us is the ingredients, the fact that it's baked in an oven that has been lit by a Jew. Um, you know, the ovens can only be turned on here and brought up to temperature by a Jew, by the owner or by myself. Um, that makes the, the bread a more spiritual product. Rabbi Kay is in a good mood because he's completed his kosher tour of Scotland. Now he's got 300 miles to drive back to his family in Manchester. Two years ago, his family were hit by a tragedy, and on the long journey back, he talks about what happened to one of his daughters. Well, she contracted leukemia by one in 70,000 or a million chance of catching it. And um, unfortunately, everything was going absolutely fantastic. She suddenly contracted a viral infection, which is untreatable, really, you know, more than just taking some painkillers and that. And unfortunately, it caused the systems to um, fail. She didn't stand a chance, you know, she didn't last a few more days and she might have um, been okay, but unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. How old was she? 11 years, 5 months. Did you find your faith helped you through that? Well, I would guess so. It's, it's one of those things, you know. A, a person, a, a, everyone, everyone comes down to this world to do a, for a purpose, to do a purpose, and the main factual reason for coming to this world is actually for the next world. And um, we have a duty to do here, and some people finish their duty earlier than others. And if we look at it that way, and other people say, oh, well, I'm going to say, well, if you look at it the other way, we had 11 years and five months. Rather than saying, oh, well, we haven't got to now look at the positive side. So, you know, it, it, it is difficult, and it's not always the reason. There are times when it's, it gets to you, and there are times, you know, but, you know, you just have to plod on, you know, you've got to always, you know, think ahead. Sometimes it's you're the one that's chosen to go through something like this. Um, now you just have to bear me a second because on, a, on every journey we make, say, a prayer in order for us to be able to return home safely. So I'm going to say that prayer now and um, then I can come back to you. Whilst Rabbi Kay is on his way back to Manchester, a team from the Beth Din is about to fly out on a regular mission. Their business is kosher slaughter. It's 5 a.m. A team from the Manchester Beth Din arrived at their hotel last night. Before they go to work comes morning prayers. This is a group of specialist rabbis who have been trained in the techniques of shikta, the controversial practice of kosher slaughter. It's not a nice job. It's not the kind of job that's clean and uh, neat and tidy like an office. So it's definitely not an attractive job that the kind of somebody would, I, from my own understanding, would try and go for. So why did I become a shochet? Well, I became a shochet because my father was a shochet. He always said to me, it's a trade worthwhile learning, because when you travel from one country to another, as, uh, as very often happened with Jewish history, 
you don't have kosher food. So if you don't have one place to another and you can pick up a chicken and you know what to do with it, you already have your next source of food. So he, he wanted me to learn for that reason. Um, he was a sheikh. I used to watch him as a child, so I knew what it entailed. I saw what the job was. At the same time, that I must, t I grew up always having pets, always having animals, and uh, it concerns me every single time I go and slaughter. This is a live animal here, and um, I'm slaughtering. I'm taking its, its its life away. So there has to be some way that I can rationalise for myself. It has to have a, a higher reason or a higher purpose why I'm doing this. Jews and Muslims have been criticized for their method of ritual slaughter, but kosher slaughtermen see it very differently. One of the reasons, among the many reasons, why we do shkita the way we do and all the, the, the job we do the way we do it is because we care so much about life and about animal life. And, and uh, you can't just kill animals for the sake of killing them. What they will do is they will show each other their knives before they begin the day's work. Reason for that being is that uh, they want to make sure that the, uh, not only in their personal opinion, but in their colleagues' opinion, their knives are put for the day's work. Uh, Pretty important from the point of view that if a person checks his own equipment, you, you may be inclined to be a bit biased. So that's one of the things we try and do to check each other's knives before we. Um, everything's got the go ahead. Everyone's happy with the equipment and they start the slaughtering. After that, approximately 20 minutes later, you will have the botkim, the searchers, they search the lungs. There's two parts to this job. There's the internal inspection of the lungs, where you'll see the one Boydek put his hand inside the cavity of the animal, the chest cavity. He'll do an internal inspection of the lungs. And when he passes it being kosher, there's different levels of why he'll pass it in kosher. You have like your, your one lung that's 100%. Then you'll have one that's in the, the 90s, and then you'll have your standard kosher one. checked for even the slightest uh, imperfection in the blade. And the best way to check it is to run the fingernail across it. And anything, if any slightest change is felt, any slight movement in the nail is felt, then he's got to put it back onto the stone and sharpen it again. <laughs> It does actually, and it really does protect, you know, protect your hand. The blade has to be 100% smooth. And besides the smoothness, can you see that? Wow. It has to be razor sharp. If it's not razor sharp, then you're not doing what's required. Apparently, yeah. if you keep them in the freezer, yeah. The electrical activity slows down to a standstill. Talk. Hello. How long does it take me to become a shaykh or an average individual? I would say on average, three years after he started, he will be acceptable. By acceptable, I mean to say by then he's learned, he knows what to do, he knows how to get the blade to where it needs to be. Ask me, is he experienced? I'll tell you no. He's not near, he's, he's, he's nowhere near there. When he's been doing this very same job for another two or three years, he's beginning to get experienced. <laughs> Kosher animals have to be in a status that we, to the best of our knowledge, presume it will live healthy for the next year. So kosher has to be a healthy animal being slaughtered. There is no doubt whatsoever it is an extremely humane process. First of all, the blade is very, very sharp. Therefore, the cut is very, very quick. The cut itself probably takes one second, if that, sometimes less, sometimes ever so slightly more, maybe two seconds, and it's all over by then. Therefore, the moment the animal's throat is slit, the blood pressure in the brain drops very, very quickly, immediately, in fact. 
The animal has no sensational pain. It doesn't look nice, and uh, we have to accept it as a reality. An animal is losing its life in order that human beings can eat. <laughs> We're not allowed to eat blood. Blood being the blood which is the blood of the life of the animal. And uh, for that reason also, when it gets slaughtered, the arteries need to be severed, and then the whole kosher process afterwards to remove blood is because we're not allowed to eat the blood. The meat comes into here, and as you can see, it's opened up so we can get the main veins out that are in the legs and all the way into the brisket. That's the process that we call porging. Uh, it usually takes all day to do, and I have quite a bit of help. Um, most of the stuff is done by the Brazilians here, but I have to check all the work that uh, they've done. Uh, and then after that, it goes into the kosher room the following day to have the salting done on it, and that finishes the kosher room process. Light's gone off again. See, look at the conditions. Look at the conditions, I feel like a coal miner in here. Well, I've been doing it for so long, I can do it blindfolded, but that light's coming on now, so hopefully there should be some light. But we take up to the 10th rib. Days that we don't take that at all. This bit is... I mean, we could take it, but there's very few people who know how to take out the veins in that. I'm not, I'm not trained for that. I've only got from here downwards. It's salted for one hour, but stays in the water for half an hour, and then gets washed off three times in three separate uh, tanks to wash off all the salt, plus a spray shower. It's a physical property of salt that it pulls, it draws out salt, it draws out blood. Put salt on a wound, you'll find it does the same thing. The Jewish obsession with the minutiae of kosher laws has a fundamental reason. Because behind all the strict Jewish laws of kosher is the belief that you are what you eat. Huh? Cooking. Uh, no speaking. Barbecue. Barbecue. He's making a barbecue. If a person eats non-kosher food, it reduces his spirituality. And if he sticks to kosher food, he leaves his spirituality intact. In fact, it grows because of the discipline behind having only the kosher product. We believe that this whole packet of laws, as far as eating is concerned, is elevates us, elevates the soul to a higher spiritual level. On the next episode of Jewish Law, Danny Scherer's grandson gets circumcised. It's Passover time. And how clean is your Jewish house? I mean, the whole idea is not to cause damage. And guess who's coming to Sabbath dinner? Oh.